Thanks a lot. So thanks for the introduction. And also thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this very nice uh, event. And also thanks in particular to Michel and Moxe for setting up this session and inviting me. Um, so I will speak about some uh, developments which took place in say the last five years or so, um, which connect very closely to what we saw this morning, in particular in the, the overview talk by Moxe. Uh, and what I would like to, to demonstrate is how to apply these, uh, these ideas in certain settings which were out of the scope of the of theory until a few years ago. And these are in particular setting of discrete problems, so an issue that already came up several times and also connects nicely to the talk by, by Oliver this morning. Uh, and there will also be a part devoted to uh, analogs in the setting of non-commutative probability, uh, so some quantum versions of these, of these ideas. Okay, but I will uh, start slowly. And sort of the starting point of the, uh, of the, of the story that I would like to tell is uh, the interpretation of two sort of well-studied uh, mathematical objects, namely diffusion equations on the one hand and Ricci curvature on, on the other hand, uh, via the tools of optimal transport. Yeah, so this is also what uh, was shown this morning and I would still, uh, there will probably be a little bit of an overlap, but I would like to uh, illustrate the main ideas once again. Yeah. So optimal transport, so here it is in a picture, is the, the classical problem which goes back to uh, the days of Monge, 18th century, and which has been developed and later on by Kantorowicz only in the 20th century. Yeah, so it's the, the problem of how to transport uh, stuff, yeah, so say products, from uh, producers to uh, consumers. Um, and there's a prescribed production, there's a prescribed demand, and the question is how should you transport the goods from, from producers X to consumers Y in such a way that the total transport costs are uh, as small as possible. Yeah. So there's a transport cost per unit and the idea is how to, can we minimize the total transport cost. Okay, so the mathematical formulation of this problem is in terms of probability measures. So there's a probability measure mu. So does this work? Oh, no. <coughs> There's a probability measure mu, which is sort of the initial distribution of the mass. There's another probability measure nu, which is the target distribution. Um, and your job is to transfer the mass from here to here. Um, so how do, you that, that, how do you do that mathematically? Well, the, the typical setting is that you're in a metric space x. There's this cost function, so c from x equals x. So c and x, y is the cost from x to y. Um, and sort of the object that you need is, is, is a coupling or a transport plan, as we already saw this morning. So and this is just a transport plan between probability measures mu and nu. This is just a probability measure on the product space with marginals mu and nu. Yeah? So it means that if you project it onto the first coordinate, you get the initial measure. If you project it onto the second coordinate, you get the target measure. And then the total transport cost is, is obtained in the following uh, minimization problem. So you integrate the cost function against your transport plan, and then you minimize over all transport plans or all couplings. Yeah. So this is the monge kantorowicz problem of optimal transport. Okay, so let me move on to, to diffusion equations. Um, and here the story really starts about 20 years ago now uh, with the work by Jordan, Kindelera, and Otto, who actually uh, gave a new uh, interpretation of the, of the classical heat equation. Uh, in the space of probability measures. Yeah. So the key object here is uh, a metric on the space of probability measures, which are called here the Kantorowicz metric, and it's often called the Wasserstein metric, as we already uh, saw this morning. And this is just uh, a distance on probability measures obtained by looking at the, the transportation problem in which the cost function is the square of the distance. Yeah. And then you take the square root to make it a, a distance on the space of probability measures. Okay, so the second object that appears is the entropy, so the Boltzmann-Shannon entropy. So I use the convention that there's no minus sign here. Uh, so the integral of rho log rho, where rho is the density of your measure. And here the reference measure is just uh, the Lebesgue measure. Okay, and the third object is the heat equation, just a plain old 
uh, heat equation that all of you know. And here's the result, uh, which read as follows. So the heat flow, so the heat equation is the gradient flow equation uh, of this entropy functional in the space of probability measures and out of this Wasserstein metric. So what does this mean, sort of heuristically speaking? Well, it gives a very nice geometric description of the heat flow. Let me, it describes the heat flow as the, as, the, as the flow, which does the following. So at every point in time, you have a certain mass distribution. And then what you do if you want to evolve in time is that you would like to minimize the entropy as fast as you can while simultaneously not moving too fast in the Wasserstein metric. Yeah. And this procedure gives you the heat equation. So it's a very neat geometric uh, picture which underlies this, this, uh, this equation. Yeah. Uh, now the question is actually what does this statement mean mathematically? Right? Um, because the point is that I told you about this Wasserstein metric yeah? and this is a distance on the space of probability measures um, but I would like to talk about gradient flows yeah? and, and, and a gradient flow that's typically something that needs at least a notion of a gradient right? and for this you need to have some sort of a smooth or Riemannian structure. Yeah? So the question is how to make sense of this, of this statement. Well, and there are actually various ways to do that. Let me just tell you one of them, um, which also turns out to be useful in the, in the rest of the talk. And to understand that, let's look at the, sort of the, the simplest possible situation. So I'm not talking now about gradient flows in the space of probability measures, but let me talk about gradient flows just in Rn. So if I have a function of phi on Rn, which is smooth and convex, uh, and if I have a curve in my space Rn, then actually the following conditions are equivalent. Firstly is that u solves this gradient flow equation, so u prime equals minus grad phi of u, if and only if the following system of inequalities holds. And these are sometimes called evolution variational inequalities, and they gave an, gave an estimate of, 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 of a quantity on the left-hand side, which is the derivative of the distance square between ut and a reference point y, and they com you compare it to the, to the difference of your functionals evaluated at your reference point y and uh, your f the value of your functional along the curve. Yeah. And this is supposed to be valid for all y. Yeah. And so to prove that these, these two are equivalent for, for convex functionals, that's actually a three-line computation. Just if you use the, the fact that, that you can characterize the gradient of a convex function as uh, using the sort of the uh, the characterization that uh, it's sort of the unique tangent line which, which lies below the surface, of, below the, the graph of your function. Okay, and now the, the remarkable thing of this, of this equivalence is that, that this formulation uses the smooth structure of, of Rn because you're talking about these derivatives and, and you're talking about the gradients. But the nice thing is that this actually only appeals to the, to the metric structure. Yeah? Because here's the derivative of a scalar quantity, maybe the square of the distance, and here's now the functional itself and no longer the gradient. So this seems like a rather complicated way to uh, formulate a simple uh, equation, um, but it's much more general, and we can actually use it also to give a rigorous meaning now to this uh, theorem by Jordan and the Otto. Namely, uh, what does this statement mean? Well, a solution to the heat equation actually satisfies this evolution variational inequality, but now with the square of your distance replaced by the Wasserstein two distance, or this Kantorovich two distance. Uh, and the functional is this entropy functional. Yeah, so that's a rigorous way to make sense of this uh, heuristic uh, idea. All right. Um, okay, so this is not just an isolated result, but this was really the starting point for uh, a lot of developments. And in particular, it turned out that this idea was, was fruitful in many different contexts. So in the years following, following that result, uh, there is analogs or, or generalizations have been proved in all kinds of, of interesting spaces. Uh, so Riemannian manifold, infinite dimensional spaces like Hilbert space, Wiener space. Also some non-Riemannian settings like uh, Finster spaces, um, uh, Alexandrov spaces. Uh, and finally, there has been sort of a, uh, a, a, a theory which, which actually covers all these cases. And it has been proved that in, in very large classes of metric measure spaces, uh, one can uh, uh, prove that, that, that the heat equation um, uh, satisfies this gradient flow property. Yeah. So in all these examples, what is proved is that the gradient flow of the, of the Dirichlet energy, which is sort of the, the traditional way to, to look at the heat equation, uh, coincides with the gradient flow of the entropy. Yeah. So the first one being in, in the L2 space and the second one being in the, in the space of probability measures and out with the Wasserstein metric. 
Um, yeah, so maybe one word. So, so why, why would you do this? Because it seems like a very complicated way to, to write a very well known and, and well understood PDE. But actually, this point of view is quite fruitful because um, it leads to, to, for instance, to new estimates. Um, you can prove all, all kinds of functional inequalities using these, these ideas. Um, it's, it's very robust, so it applies to, to all kinds of spaces. Um, and it turns out that it really opens the door to, to connections to geometry uh, that I would like to come to right now. And this is this idea of curvature via optimal transport, which also appeared already this morning. So here's sort of a cartoon which describes the idea. Um, so it turns out that we can uh, describe Ritchie curvature in terms of properties of the entropy and optimal transport. And um, Villani in his book on optimal transport, which is sort of the basic reference, uh, he calls this the lazy gas experiment. Yeah. So the idea is, this, is the following. So suppose that we have a space of positive curvature, like the, like the sphere here. And imagine that you have a probability measure which is concentrated in this, in this little green area over here at time zero. And you think about your probability densing, density as representing some cloud of particles. And now you would like to transport your mass at this initial con con uh, location here to the target destination over here. Uh, and now the, the thing is that this gas is lazy. Uh, so what does it mean? All your particles, they would like to arrive at their destination as fast as they can, so they travel along shortest paths, so along geodesics on the sphere. So if you follow the trajectories of these particles, and if you look at what happens at, at time one half, what you see is actually that due to the curvature of the sphere, the positive curvature of the sphere uh, causes this, this density actually to spread out. Yeah. So that's really the effect of the curvature. Uh, and now the thing is that if you now look at the graph of the entropy along this interpolation, uh, at least with the sign convention that I'm using, you will see that the entropy has the convex profile. Yeah? Because the entropy is a measure of how spread out my probability distribution is. And in the middle, it will be much more spread out than at the, at the sides due to the curvature. OK, so this, this cartoon sort of really, I think, capture, captures very much the idea of this, of, the, uh, of, of interpreting Ritchie curvature in terms of, of optimal transport and entropy. OK, so, so the, the story was, was as follows. So first, this, this result was discovered uh, by Robert McCann in his PhD thesis. So he proved that in, in the space Rn, actually, you have this nice convexity property of the entropy along optimal transport. Yeah, so the entropy is convex along geodesics in the space of probability measures with this W2 metric. Yeah. And then there was the, the generalization to uh, Riemannian manifolds, uh, which, which was sort of a three-step uh, thing. So, so one direction was in the work by Otto Villani, um, and also in the work by, by Cordero, McKenna, and Schmuckenschläger. And then the converse was, was proved by von der Nesse and Sturm. Yeah. So they showed that if you are on a Riemannian manifold, then the following are equivalent. First of all, is the Ritchie curvature is bounded from below by some constant kappa everywhere on your manifold, if and only if uh, the entropy satisfies this convexity inequality. Um, and if you look at the first line, it's just convexity. And then there's a correction term uh, which involves the curvature constant kappa. So it basically just tells you that the second derivative along this uh, interpolation is bounded from below by kappa. So that's sort of the, the translation of this picture, which was proved by, by those authors. OK, and well, this was sort of the starting point of, of again, many, many developments. And in particular, um, again, this, uh, this characterization gives a very robust uh, formulation of Ritchie curvature. It makes sense in, in metric measure spaces, because to define the Wasserstein distance, I only need a distance. To define entropy, I need to have a reference measure, but I don't need anything else. So you can put this as a definition of Ritchie curvature of a metric measure space, or more precisely, not really of Ritchie curvature itself, but of being lower bounded uh, or, or having lower bounded Ritchie curvature. Um, so you can take this as a definition, and that was what uh, Sturm and Lotfilani did in independent works. And they wrote uh, pioneering papers um, uh, developing this, this, this theory. So why is this useful? Well, first of all, it applies to, to a, a large class of, of metric measure spaces, as we already saw some, some, some examples before. Um, you can actually derive many interesting consequences uh, taking this point of view. So you can derive many geometric, analytic, and probabili uh, probabilistic consequences, uh, like those uh, inequalities, which have uh, a lot of applications. 
Uh, and the third property, which is really crucial, is that it's, 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 it's actually stable. Yeah, that's also what uh, Moxa mentioned this morning. So if you take a sequence of metric spaces, say smooth Riemannian manifolds, and they are allowed to convert to a, to a singular space, um, then if they con uh, converge in the sense of, of measured gromov hausdorff then the Ricci curvature bound is preserved. And this allows you actually to prove results in singular spaces. Okay, so, so this really um, gave rise to a very rich and, and beautiful theory where many uh, results have been proved in the, in the past 10 years or so. So many results from Riemannian geometry have now been transferred to this non-smooth setting. Um, so in some sense, the, the theory is, is really quite mature at this stage, but still there are quite many uh, interesting and important uh, contributions happening uh, uh, at this moment. I'm sure that uh, Theo Sturm would have taught you about this also uh, if he uh, would have been here. Um, all right, so this is a very active research area. Okay, so um, let's now come to this question. So, so what happens if we, if we move to discrete spaces? And uh, because I told you that actually all these ideas are very robust, you don't need, need anything else than a, than a metric and a measure, so it seems very tempting just to apply these results in the setting of discrete spaces. Um, okay, so let's do something, uh, 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 well, the most simple thing we can actually think of. Uh, let's take a space of two points and, and see what happens. <coughs> so if I'm on the two-point space, I can write every probability density, I can write it in this form. So it's a convex combination of a Dirac at zero and a Dirac at one. In this measure, I call mu alpha. And then you can just easily check that the Wasserstein two distance, or the Kantorowicz two distance, between two of those measures is actually, given to, uh, is actually equal to the square root of alpha minus beta. Yeah, so the square root of the amount of mass that you need to, to transfer. Yeah, and the square root is due to the fact that we have Wasserstein two. Okay, now suppose that we are in the space of probability measures on this two-point space, and suppose that we have a geodesic. Because geodesics are sort of crucial to make the whole theory work, because the notion of curvature is based on geodesic convexity. Well, if you have a geodesic, what does it mean? It means that the distance between uh, mu alpha t and mu alpha s is proportional to t minus s. And that's just the definition of being a geodesic. Uh, but we just saw that this is actually equal to the square root of alpha t minus alpha s. But now, if you look at the left and the right, then you see that it's actually a contradiction, because this means that alpha is, is the order continuous of exponent two, and of course that cannot be unless your curve is constant. Yeah. So the moral is that, that it, it, there are no geodesics. Yeah? So I started with an arbitrary geodesic, and I showed that it's constant. Yeah? So that means that as soon as you try to apply any of these, of these very nice ideas, which are uh, very general, work in a large class of metric measure spaces, if you try to do it in a two-point space, you don't get anything, because there are just no geodesics. Yeah? So all your conditions become just, just void. OK, and this is not, not just a, a defect of the two-point space, but this is just uh, comes from the fact that we are discrete. So you can show that the, the space of probability measures endowed with the Wasserstein two metric or the Kantorowicz two metric is a geodesic space if and only if the underlying space itself is, is geodesic. Yeah. Okay, so, and, um, so this means basically that you cannot apply this definition of, of Ricci curvature. Well, you can also show there are actually no curves of finite lengths. So it means you can actually find not, or you cannot find any gradient flow. So also this, interpretation of the, of the discrete heat equation as a gradient flow of the entropy uh, has no chance to be true if you use this Wasserstein geometry. So the question uh, arises, uh, what, what to do? Right? So is there, it would be very nice if there were an analog of this JKO theorem, so the interpretation of the heat flow, and if there were a discrete variant of this lotfi lani uh, theory of, of, of Ricci curvature. Okay, so that's what we, what we have been trying to work on. Um, so here's the setting. So it, it's just to fix some notation. Let's take a finite set to keep things as easy as possible. Um, let Q, X, Y be the transition rate from X to Y for, for a Markov chain on my discrete space. Uh, and let's assume that there is a reversible uh, probability measure, which I call pi. So reversibility just means that I have this, uh, what is often called the detailed balance equations are satisfied for my Markov chain. Well, then there is a natural discrete uh, heat flow. So uh, the generator of that is this, the, the generator of my Markov chain, which I denote by L, uh, the generator of transition rates Q, X, Y. 
And I denote by PT the semigroup generated by this operator. Well, of course, <laughs> there's also a natural notion of, of, uh, of, of entropy. Uh, well, it's just the same as we saw before. So just to fix notation, because there's in the discrete case, there's often confusion between densities and measures. Yeah? So it will be convenient for the formulas that I'm going to, going to write to denote by P of X to be uh, the set of all probability densities with respect to a fixed reference measure pi, mm -hmm. which is the stationary measure of my Markov chain. And then I can look at the relative entropy uh, of such a density, which is given by the sum of rho x log rho x times pi x. So just the relative entropy that we saw before. OK, so that's just a fixed notation. So there is a natural heat flow. There is a natural entropy. Now the question is, is there also a natural distance, right? Because we needed to have this Wasserstein metric to have this gradient flow structure for the heat equation. OK, so first you can ask, well, is the discrete heat flow the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this, this Wasserstein metric? Well, we have already argued the answer is no. And the reason is, again, that this Wasserstein metric just scales the, the wrong way. So you can ask now, is it then true that the heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to a different metric on the space of probability measures? Well, and sort of the naive thing is, again, to, to, to see what happens on the two-point space. And there, everything is explicit. And you actually find, well, there is one. And this is it. So the distance between mu alpha and mu beta is given by this uh, uh, strange uh, formula, <coughs> which is maybe not the first thing you would have tried if you were looking for uh, a distance on probability measures. But this is an explicit computation which shows you that this is the thing uh, which gives you the gradient flow structure. OK, so the question is, of course, what, what is the, the general discrete framework to, uh, in which a result like this should be true? OK, so to, to understand that, let's again uh, move to the continuous setting. Uh, and in the continuous setting, there is actually a different way to look at the, the Kantorovich metric. Uh, and that's actually through the benamou brunier formula, which actually also figured in, in Oliver's talk this morning. Yeah. So the idea is, again, uh, easily illustrated by, by means of a picture. So uh, here's a probability density, rho naught, which is uh, concentrated in this this area over here. And uh, here's sort of the, the target distribution, which is, which is located over here. But now, instead of just looking at sort of the, the optimal coupling, we actually would like now to, to look at the continuous time interpolation between those densities. Yeah. So again, we regard those densities as, as clouds of particles. And we would like to, to construct a, a path in the states of probability measures connecting those two. Yeah. So that's indicated by rho t. Uh, and I can actually uh, look at the velocity factor field, which describes the speed of, and the direction of the particles which are being transported along this, this interpolation. Uh, and the velocity factor field is denoted by, by psi. So here's again the picture. And now here's the, here's the formula, uh, which is due to benamou brunier And it tells you that this, this quadratic Wasserstein distance can be obtained uh, by another minimization problem, uh, which is very natural, uh, namely, um, uh, the, the quantity that you're minimizing now is actually the kinetic energy, so the total kinetic energy along your transport. Yeah, so you're squaring the velocity, uh, in, integrating against the mass. Yeah, so that gives you the kinetic energy. And you're minimizing uh, the kinetic energy among all possible interpolations in the space of probability measures. Um, and and uh, so that means you're minimizing over all, over all curves rho and over all factor fields psi. And they're supposed to be related uh, through this continuity equation. Yeah, so the continuity equation is basically just mean that uh, what is illustrated in the picture, uh, that that's true. Yeah. OK, so this is a, this is a, a very useful uh, alternative description of the Wasserstein, Wasserstein distance, which holds true in, in continuous uh, settings. And now the idea is as following. So maybe uh, we have seen that this W2 was not the right thing to, to work with in the in the discrete case, at least not for our purposes. So maybe we should actually take this as a, as a starting point of our, uh, of our approach. And, and that's actually what we did. Uh, so just one remark. So you can actually show that, that the optimal uh, factor field, uh, the optimal velocity factor field, is always a gradient. Yeah? So you can actually uh, minimize over a smaller class uh, of, of, of factor fields. You only need to look at gradient of factor fields. OK, so, so let's now back, go back to the discrete case and, and see if we can actually use this uh, to, 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 uh, to define now 
a metric on the space of probability measures, uh, which has some good properties and which could be a reasonable analog of this W2 uh, metric. So here's once again the formula in the continuous case that I just showed you. <coughs> and let's now, tr uh, let's now try to, to actually write a discrete analog of this guy. Well, that's of course um, uh, some objects. It, it's very, very, very easy to do that. So let's just replace um, this, this gradient in this formulation here. Let's just uh, replace it by a discrete gradient, just by a finite difference. Um, of course, the integral is now replaced by, by a sum. Um, the role of the, of the Lebesgue measure here is now taken by sort of the, the, the weights involved in your Markov chain. So they, if you want, these are weights on the edges of your graph. Yeah, so Q were the transition rates and pi was the reference measure. Uh, but now that you see, you see that there is a little issue, because in the continuous setting, what you have here is you have a vector field evaluated at a point in space, and you're multiplying with the density at the same point. But in a discrete case, you cannot easily do that. Because if you have a, a discrete derivative, it's not defined at a single point, but it's really between those two points, right? So it's defined along an edge and not at a vertex. Whereas your density is really defined at a, at a vertex of your graph. Yeah? So the question is, should you put here row of x, should you put here row of y, or should you put, put here something different? Yeah? So there seems to be a choice here. It's not completely uh, canonical in the discrete case. Yeah. So, so that's the problem. So, so how to proceed? Rho is defined on vertices, and, and discrete gradient is defined uh, along edges. OK, so I'll tell you what it turns out to be the right thing to do, and then I'll come back to it and explain to you uh, why this is a good idea. Um, so what you need to do is you need to put here something which is actually a suitable average of rho x and rho y. <coughs> you need to do it in a particular way. Namely, what we do is we take the logarithmic mean of the density at x and the density at y. Yeah. So obviously, that is not a canonical choice, but it turns out, uh, turns out to work, and I, I will explain why. Sorry? Yeah. Excuse that you're doing very fast, but I, I kind of lost ah. myself. Because the first thing is, you're saying, like, instead of the leg measure in the continuous case, so we're taking this thing, but this thing represents more like the transition of a market chain. So like, you're taking something that is kind of static, like, you would expect, in fact, at this size, something like a distribution on your finite set. Uh, if you really want an analysis of the Lebesgue measure, when you're introducing something that looks more like a dynamic as just grasp of your thing. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right that it depends on the Markov chain, the, the construction that I, that I give here. But you sh I mean, at this stage, you shouldn't think about this as being a, a, a transition probability. Just think about it that you have a weighted graph and that you put some weights on your graph. And it's sort of natural that the weights on your graph that they yeah, show up in the. You're adding structure because at the beginning you just began with a finite set, but now you're putting a graph and weights in the graph. And I mean, like you're adding all that and why? I mean, well, why, why is that uh, necessary? Well, I mean, here uh, there's also structure named the Lebesgue measure, but it's so simple that you don't see much here, right? So maybe it's that. Uh, yeah, so maybe I, I could have also written something more general in the well, continuous. I mean, well, what are the nice properties of the Lebesgue measure that otherwise you don't have? Well, um, so, so for instance, that if I would like to write uh, such a formula on Riemannian manifolds, um, then you would, hear, uh, would have here the volume measure of your Riemannian manifolds. So also the geometry of your underlying space appears. In the discrete case, it's the same thing. So you don't have the volume measure of your manifold, but you have some, some weight on your edges. So there, there's nothing like a volume measure as far as I know. As far as I know, um, but somehow, sort of, the geometry of the object that you're working with should enter the definition of your transport distance. And 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 it's the, I agree that it does not look like a direct uh, analog, um, but it's really the same idea in some sense. Yeah. Um, you, you're right, also that that I in moving from continuous to discrete, I changed in a little bit the structure. So in in the in the continuous world, sort of the natural setup was really the setup of metric measure spaces. So your data were uh, a metric space endowed with a measure. Um, in the discrete case, uh, the natural starting point, at least for, for many of those things, is, is to start with a Markov generator on a discrete set. You don't, the, you don't have the gradient flow, so you're replacing it by the flow generated by the Markov chain, something like that. Yeah, if you want, yeah. So, I don't yeah. know. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to have a natural heat equation in this discrete case, and, and this comes from my Markov chain, or from the geometry of, my, of, your, of the graph. Uh, 
Right, okay, so I, I'm, I was still in the middle of this formula. Um, so I, I was trying to, to mimic this definition. Um, um, and, and I argued that, that actually there's a choice to be made here. And, and, and the thing which turns out to work is to put here the logarithmic mean of the densities. Also, we need to discretize the continuity equation. Um, and that's a little bit the same story. So uh, again, you can discretize the gradient in the way you would expect. But then again, you run into this problem that you're multiplying something on edges with something on vertices. And then you need to use this, this logarithmic mean. Okay, but the thing is that this is some analog of this, of this formula, which is, I think, the natural discrete analog, except that there is one choice to be made, namely how you take averages between, uh, between densities at, at neighboring vertices. And that's something that you don't see in the continuous setting, but something which arises if you're, if you're in the discrete world. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the definition. Um, well, this actually uh, gives you a distance of probability on the space of probability measures. Even better, it's actually a, a, a Riemannian. Uh, so this is the distance of a Riemannian metric on the simplex of, of probability distributions. Yeah, so this is on the interior of your simplex, at least, it's just a Riemannian, uh, Riemannian metric. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and here's the result, uh, which I proved a few years ago. And independently, it was obtained by Milk in a, in a slightly different setting of, of reaction diffusion equations. Um, the thing is that the discrete heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this metric. So the direct analog of this result by Jordan, Kinderleer, and Otto. But now with the Kantorovich metric replaced by this, by this new metric. And so this is the result that we wanted to obtain and which sort of justifies uh, the choice of, of the, or the, the definition that I made. So the question is why, why does this logarithmic mean show up? Um, because this was, uh, of course, a bit mysterious. Um, so there's, I, I'm not going to give you the proof, but one can understand this in the following way. <coughs> so if you go back again to the continuous world, because then the formulas look a bit simpler, um, then if you want to prove that the heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy, what you need to do is you need to write your heat equation, you need to write it in this form. So you want to write it as a continuity equation yeah, to make the link with transport. And you can do that provided that your factor field psi is minus the gradient of log rho. Yeah, that's just uh, uh, the chain rule, right? Because rho times grad of log rho is, is grad rho, and then you see that you get the right formula. It's a trivial computation. Uh, but now the thing is that here you're actually using uh, the continuous structure. Because in the discrete uh, setting, uh, we don't have a chain rule for the derivative. Um, so it's not clear how to, how to do this step in a discrete case. And now the thing is exactly that, that we use this logarithmic mean um, to overcome this problem and uh, to do some algebraic computation which gets rid of this dif dif difficulty. Because the thing is this, this logarithmic mean written in this integrated form here, you can actually also write it as, as this difference quotient. So the difference of rho x minus rho y divided by log rho x minus log rho y. Um, and, and if you do that, then you can sort of imagine that, that, it, uh, that it gives you a, a tool to get a, to get a, a discrete counterpart to, to doing this computation. So there's no chain rule in the discrete world. That, that's the problem. But we can actually enforce it for one particular function if you want. Um, and, and that's good enough to prove this result. OK, so now this actually is sort of the starting point for a discrete notion of, of, of Ritchie curvature. Um, which is now very, very natural, just the direct analog of this lot storm villani theory. Uh, so in a work with Matthias Erbar, um, uh, we said that the Markov chain has Ritchie curvature bounded from below by some constant if the entropy is uh, k convex, yeah, so where k is the lower bound on the curvature, uh, along geodesics in the space of probability measures. Yeah, so here's the... Uh, the cartoon, so the exact same definition, but now with the, with the new metric. Um, and this new metric is a Riemannian metric, so it comes with geodesics. Um, so now this is actually meaningful, where with the Wasserstein distance, it would have been an, an empty condition in the discrete case. Okay, so just to illustrate with one slide that, that we can obtain some, uh, some useful uh, results using this concept. Um, so we can uh, obtain a discrete analog of, of the, of the Bakri-Emery uh, theorem. The Bakri-Emery theorem was 
proved first at the beginning of the 80s <coughs> by Bakri and Emery, and they showed that on a Riemannian manifold, that if you have a, a, a strictly positive lower bound on the Ritchie curvature, then you have a logarithmic Sobolev inequality, um, what we saw this morning in, in, in various talks, actually. Um, now, the thing is that if, uh, that if we have a Markov chain satisfying a lower bound on the curvature in the sense that we, that we consider, then actually you obtain a very natural discrete counterpart. Yeah? Maybe you can show that if you have a lower bound on the curvature, then this, uh, what is sometimes called modified log Sobolev inequality, holds, and it gives uh, an upper bound on the entropy in terms of some constant involving curvature uh, and uh, a quantity which is a discrete version of the Fisher information. Yeah. And I call this, uh, I call this modified log Sobolev inequality because in the discrete world there are different variants of the log Sobolev inequality which actually also arise uh, due to the fact of th that there's no chain rule in the discrete world. So you can look at various equivalent ways to write it in the continuous setting, but they give rise to different notions in the discrete world. Well, this particular one um, is useful because this uh, functional i, which is the Fisher information, uh, is actually equal to the, to the dissipation of the entropy uh, along your evolution. So that means that uh, using a Grunwald argument, uh, this inequality immediately gives you the exponential decay of your entropy uh, along your Markov chain. So you can use this curvature information to say something about the speed of convergence to equilibrium of your, of your Markov chain. Okay, well, there are various other, other consequences. Um, let me not say too much about this. There is an analog of an inequality by Otto and Villani, which relates this, this transport distance and, and entropy uh, under the assumption of uh, a log Sobolev inequality. And there are also connections to other transport inequalities and to, to spectral gap. But maybe let me not tell that story. Um, okay, so let me move to a, to a different setting. Um, and this is based on a joint work with Eric Carlin. Uh, where we asked ourselves the question, is there also a version of these, these ideas which works in the setting of, of dissipative quantum systems? Uh, um, so let me just give you again one slide with the setup. Um, so let H be a Hilbert space. And if you want, during all what I'm gonna say, assume that it's finite dimensional because it's already uh, non-trivial there. Um, and let's look at, at, at uh, the space of density matrices. Uh, so P of H, these are now not probability densities, but they are density matrices, means, meaning that they are operators on my Hilbert space, uh, which are positive and self-adjoint, uh, and which have trace one. And so this is just a natural uh, non-commutative analog of being a probability density, if you think about the trace as being some uh, non-commutative analog of the, of the integral. Okay, and now we're interested uh, in, um, in the following class of semigroups, uh, which are TPCP semigroups, so trace preserving and completely positive. So they're semigroups acting on density matrices, and they have two properties. Uh, first of all, they preserve the trace. And secondly, um, they are what is called completely positive. And that means that uh, these semigroups actually preserve positivity, but they actually have a stronger property Namely, if I look at the tensor product uh, of my semigroup with the identity, then it still preserves pos positivity. Yeah. Okay, so that is the class of, 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 of operators uh, that I'm interested in. And the fact is that uh, um, there is a structure theorem uh, which tells you exactly how the, or what the generator of such a semigroup uh, looks like, at least in finite dimensions. Um, namely, the generator can be written in what's called Lindblad form, uh, which tells you that it looks like this. Um, so there's, there's two parts. There's, uh, firstly, there's a Hamiltonian part. So there's the commutator of your density matrix with a Hamiltonian H. Uh, and then there's a second order part uh, in which um, also commutators appear uh, with operators Vjs. So the Vjs are again uh, uh, bounded operators on my, on my Hilbert space. Um, and you should think about this as, as describing sort of the evolution of an open quantum system. So this is just the Hamiltonian part coming from the Schrodinger equation. And this part is the, is the dissipative part, uh, which represents the interaction with the, with the environment of your system. Okay, so we're interested in, in, in evolution equations of, of, of that form as generated by these kind of operators. 
Um, okay, so let's assume that we have a stationary state, so sigma, um, for, um, uh, for this evolution, meaning just that, that uh, L dagger of sigma equals zero. And let's look at the, the natural entropy functional in this setting, which is the, the, the relative entropy with respect to the stationary state. And now it's the trace of rho log rho minus the trace of uh, rho log sigma, and so the quantum relative entropy. And now it's a classical result by Spohn from the, from the 70s that along this Lindblad equations, the relative entropy is, uh, is monotonically uh, decreasing. Yeah. <clears throat> So this is already sort of the first step, if you want, towards, or at least this should be true if, if there is any hope for, for obtaining a, a, a gradient flow structure, that what is what we want. So the question is, is, is there a stronger version of this theorem? So is there actually a geometry on the space of density matrix, matrices in which we can formulate these Lindblad equations as gradient flows of these quantum relative entropy? So the same question that we asked also in the setting of Markov chains. Um, so let me just, just give you one example. Um, which is sometimes called quantum ornstein ullenbeck So take an operator A satisfying this commutation relation. So A commutation uh, with, with A star equals the identity. So if you want to realize that concretely on a Hilbert space, you can do it on L2 of R and that with the Gaussian measure. Uh, and you take for A uh, the derivative and let A star be the adjoint of the derivative with respect to the Gaussian uh, L2 scalar product. And then let's now consider the following operator, uh, which is exactly of the term that we saw before. So now there's no Hamiltonian part, um, but there are two terms involving the operator A and, and, and A star, and they're different weights, e to the beta over two and e to the minus beta over two. Okay. Well, this semi-group has, has uh, nice properties. We can explicitly calculate the stationary state, <coughs> and it has of the following form. So there's a normalizing constant times e to the minus beta h, uh, where h is actually a star a, and this is just the classical ornstein ullenbeck operator. And so this is the stationary state of, of our evolution. And there was a conjecture which appeared in a paper last year, I think July or so on the, on the archive, and it was a conjecture about the speed of convergence to equilibrium in this relative entropy sense. Maybe it was conjectured that um, uh, we have exponential convergence with an explicit rate uh, depending on this parameter beta. And this was conjectured based on some uh, explicit computations on, on certain states on which you can explicitly evaluate the evolution. But for general initial conditions, this was, was not proved, it was a conjecture. So what we will show is actually that we can prove the, the conjecture using these this transport, uh, transport ideas. Okay, so let me go back to the, to, the, to the general setting. So to get this gradient flow structure, I need to, to have a little bit more uh, information, namely I need to have some sort of a symmetry condition. Uh, like in the Markov chains, there was this reversibility. Here there's something similar, which is quantum detailed balance. So let's PT dagger again such a semigroup. Uh, and let's look at now at, at, at its adjoint uh, with respect to trace duality. And so with respect to the scalar product on matrices given, given as follows. And then we say that, um, a density operator, a density matrix, satisfies detailed balance if the same group P is self-adjoint in, if you want, in, in this weighted L2 scalar product. Yeah, so this non-commutative L2 weighted scalar product. Well, this is condition, and you can show that, for instance, in the previous example, it's satisfied. And now the thing is that once you have this condition, there's actually a, a, a theorem which actually gives you another form of the, of the generator of, of those semigroups, uh, which looks like what we saw before, but there's now actually more symmetry built into the, into the, into the construction. Uh, namely, these Vj operators, they come in pairs. So if Vj is contained, then also Vj star is contained. Um, and there are some weights here, and these are not arbitrary, but they are, are sort of determined um, by, the, by the invariant measure sigma. And so there's a very, a strong structural uh, uh, form which follows from this detailed balance, uh, balance condition. Okay, so now the question is, is can we formulate this Lindblad equation as a gradient flow uh, of the entropy? Um, I will show you that we can do that, and to do that, let me just uh, simplify things a little bit. Let's assume that first that the stationary state is, is just the identity. 
that would be sort of, it would be like saying that assume that we work with the Lebesgue measure as a reference measure, something like that. Um, then this detailed balance just means that L is, is self adjoint with respect to trace duality. Now, to make the analog between the continuous and the, and the quantum and the discrete uh, as explicit as possible, let us write partial derivatives to denote these commutators. So if we do that, then we can actually write our generator under this detailed balance assumption. We can write it in, in divergence form. So it really looks like a Laplacian, but now with commutators replacing partial derivatives. And this is already sort of the first step toward this gradient flow formulation. So once we have this, there's again a natural idea, namely to define a distance by an analog of this benoumou brunier formula, um, in which the partial derivatives are now replaced by, by commutators and their adjoints. Um, but just as in the discrete case, there's, there's an obstruction. Namely, uh, in the discrete case, we had trouble multiplying functions defined on vertices and functions defined on edges. Here, there's something similar, because we would like to multiply objects, but multiplication is non-commutative. So there's not a canonical way to define a product here. And so the question is, how should we define a product on density matrices um, to get uh, this gradient flow structure? And well, that's the, that's the question. And, and again, what we want is we want like to have some sort of a version of this, of, this, of, this, of this chain rule for the logarithm, which was sort of the key algebraic step in the computation. Uh, and we need something similar, but now we need it for commutators. Well, and it's actually, let me just show you a, a well-known computation which shows you that there is such a thing. And this sort of uh, also dictates then the choice of the product that we need uh, to work with. So let me show you that there is a very nice non-commutative chain rule for, for commutators, uh, which, which can be uh, shown in a few lines. So again, let us write these partial derivatives to denote uh, the commutator. And then observe that, that these commutators are, of course, derivations. So there's a Leibniz rule. Um, therefore, I can iterate it. So I can apply the Leibniz rule to a to the n. I get this, uh, this expression. And now this is true for, or, or I can just do uh, now a substitution. I can write instead of a to the n, I can, I can write rho. So I do the substitution rho equals a to the 1 over n. If I do that, I get this formula. And now if you, you see that the left-hand side does not appear to depend on n, or it does not depend on n, whereas the right-hand side, it appears like it does depend on n, but it's equal to the left-hand side, so it actually doesn't. Uh, so it's very tempting now actually to pass to the limit in n on the right-hand side. And you already recognize this as some sort of a Riemann sum. So if I pass to the limit, then you actually this converges to this, to this integral. So it follows that dj of rho is equal to this, if you want, this non-commutative product of rho and dj of log rho. If I multiply in the right way, so I need to put rho to the s on the left, rho to the 1 minus f on the right, and then integrate in s. And so the cute thing is that just starting from this Leibniz rule, I can actually derive a chain rule for the logarithm, just to, using nothing, nothing else. OK, so this computation shows that if you want to have this, this product rule, it shows us actually how we should define multiplication in our transport distances. Um, and once we do that, we get a natural analog now, again, of this JKO theorem. So here's the theorem. So suppose that you have a, a TPCP semigroup satisfying detailed balance. Then this Lindblad equation is the gradient flow equation uh, for the von Neumann entropy with respect to this new metric in which we uh, uh, have the right choice of the product. Yeah, so it's defined by this non-commutative version of the benamou brunier formula uh, with this logarithmic mean appearing here. Yeah, so this is the non-commutative analog of the statement, what I had before for Markov chains. OK. OK, well, th this was all true under the simplifying assumption that my stationary state was a multiple of the identity. Um, so actually, the theorem also holds in the general case. And it took us a bit longer to figure that out, because the algebra is a bit more complicated. So then we would need uh, a non-commutative chain rule, which looks like this for uh, density matrices rho and, 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 and sigma. So we need an analog of, of, for matrices of this, this identity. It turns out that, that there is such a thing, and it looks like this. So one needs to put square roots in the right places. 
and one needs, also, one needs to modify the definition of the product. So it doesn't really matter precisely what the form is, but you see that there, it's a bit more complicated than what we had before. There are these omega j's, which, which came from the definition of detailed balance, which show up in this, in this product. Um, um, so the formula is a bit more complicated, but the structure is exactly the same. So the, the result is that uh, if we have detailed balance with respect to some stationary state, then we have the gradient flow structure with respect to the metric defined by this product. How much time do I have? Um, One minute? Four minutes. Four minutes. Oh. Okay, I think probably then I'm not uh, saying too much about, about what is going to follow. Um, so having this structure, it, it really opens the, opens the door for, for bringing some very uh, powerful techniques also to this new setting. And in particular, one thing that we, that we could do was we could actually prove this conjecture um, using these this transport ideas. And how does this work? Well, it, it really goes, um, goes through the gradient flow structure and using some geodesic convexity properties of the, of the entropy. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how can we prove geodesic convexity uh, of the entropy in, in, in some examples? Um, well, let me not go through this, through this in detail because it's getting too technical. Um, let me just, uh, I just would like to make the point that at the beginning of the talk, I showed you this uh, description of, of the, of, of the Wasserst uh, Wasserstein gradient flow in terms of this evolution variational inequality involving the Wasserstein metric and entropy. And the thing is that once you can prove that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that inequality, uh, it actually gives you very strong information. So it tells you that the driving functional of your gradient flow is convex. Um, and here is a, is, there is a one slight argument uh, so maybe let's not go through it, but just I would like to make the point. It's just a few lines, um, which actually allows you allows you to prove by hand um, that this this uh, that this evolution variational inequality is satisfied at least for the heat equation on R n, uh, and this is by an argument which is actually very reminiscent of, of an argument that, that uh, Michel Ledoux used to prove the, the Gaussian log Sobolev inequality. Um, namely, there are two two ingredients in the, in this computation which which are crucial. Um, so, so one thing that you use is you use some intertwining between gradients and semigroups. And another thing which comes in is there's some convexity uh, uh, inequality happening here. Maybe there's a scalar function, maybe the function a squared divided by r, uh, which is jointly convex as a function of a and r. And that's a very, I mean, it's elementary, but it's very useful in, in these kinds of computations. And this allows you to prove the geodesic convexity of the, uh, of the, of the entropy in, in the commutative setting. And our idea was, let's try to generalize this to the, to the non-commutative setting. Uh, and the thing is that also in this, in this ornstein lundbeck example, we can make that work um, because there is, uh, there is an intertwining relation um, and there is a good analog of, of, uh, of convexity of, of, the, of, uh, of this scalar-valued function, um, namely, uh, there are very nice uh, uh, trace inequalities um, or, or convexity inequalities for, for trace uh, functions of matrices. So this function is jointly convex in A and R, and now A and R are positive definite matrices. And, and omega are just real parameters. So if omega were zero, and if everything were scalar, it would just reduce to this inequality. Um, but there is this, this matrix valued version, which is, is powerful and which allows us to do the, the analog also in this non commutative setting. Yeah. So, this is something which actually goes back to an old uh, result by Elliot Leap. Okay, so here's the, uh, the result about this example of the quantum Ornstein Ullenbach semi group um, that actually we obtain um, the, the geodesic convexity of the relative entropy in that setting, and as a consequence, we obtain the uh, decay of the entropy with, with these uh, sharp constants, proving this conjecture. Okay. So the point that I was trying to make is that, uh, that I think there are these interesting uh, settings um, where the ideas of, of using optimal transport are, are relatively, uh, or, or not very well developed yet, but I think there's quite some potential to bring ideas that have been very powerful in metric measure spaces and to try to bring them to those kind of settings. Okay, so thank you.